Equity, uh, the people, the, the original shareholders of Equity decided to form the company because we wanted to go out on our own at that point. We had had enough of large corporations. From that point on, we wanted to be employee-owned. Um, we originally were. All the shareholders essentially were employee. All, all, most of the employees were originally shareholders. Everybody was given the opportunity. Then what happened is that the company went through a rapid growth period. This developed a very strong brand in the industry. And um, around 2007, we're starting to look at where we are. We're looking at succession planning, and we're deciding on when is the time to get this company as an employee-owned entity. At that point, I began to do some research. I found uh, information out about ESOPs through a consultant I work with. And uh, we, we spoke to Jay about over a year and a half ago. Um, we brought Joe Cassaro on board, who is the legal person that put the whole program together. So we're, we're actually starting on the journey right now. And we've done all the legal work. The company's transitioned. Now we're facing the cultural part of it and the so-called um, ownership culture that has to be created in equity. In many instances, I think we're, we, we do have some ownership culture, but we have a ways to go. Not uncommon for a company that is just starting on this path. This is going to be the first of many training sessions that are going to be run by the communications group. Uh, they'll be run many times by the group, and they'll also be run with Jay and Kathy. We may even see Joe again come back for a couple of uh, guest visits. So again, I'd like to um, uh, ask everybody to participate, and please ask questions. If, if there's any confusion, if there's any uh, needs that you need to know or you're nervous about something, put it on the table. That's the whole point of the communications committee. This committee actually is yours. Ultimately, you'll nominate people to it. You control it. Okay, so this is, this is management's way of communicating to the employees is through this group. So I thank you, and let's get started. Great, great. Thanks, David. Thank you for uh, that little introduction. Again, as David indicated, this is the first of uh, probably many training sessions to follow. We're calling it our initial rollout. Uh, we're calling this uh, Understanding Your ESOP. Uh, we'll talk about uh, ESOPs in general, and we'll talk about your plan in specifically. Okay? Kathy, you want to say hello? Oh, hello. <laughs> My name's Kathy Ivancy. I'm with Workplace Development Incorporated, and Jay and I are going to go back and forth uh, in this presentation. We want to make sure that if you have a question, that you speak up and interrupt us as we move forward. Yes, uh, you, you can do that. Obviously, we want you to do that. Uh, we will try to answer your questions the best we can. And if it, if it uh, we are under a time constraint, so we may want to uh, defer some of those answers uh, to later. But uh, the, the committee will answer later. Right. Okay. Also, you have a chat box in the lower, lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you don't want to interrupt us and you want to record your, your question, feel free to use the chat box. Okay. I moved you forward, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, the agenda is, uh, as you see in front of you, uh, what is an ESOP? Uh, we're going to talk about ESOPs in general, where they came from, and what they are, just in, in generic terms. We're going to take a short survey, uh, a very short survey, of uh, your existing opinions and your perceptions. Uh, we, we know that um, a major change has just occurred. Uh, as of uh, last October at Equity Engineering, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions and, and maybe some uh, uh, perceptions or misconceptions. Um, who pays for the ESOP? Where does it, where does it come from? Uh, one of the, the, the often misconceptions of, of ESOPs is that we have to buy stock in our company. Well, that's not true. Uh, so how does it get funded? And what does it mean for you? This is really the key bullet on this on, on the agenda. Um, we're all interested in what it means to me, what's in it for me, and you need to understand that. What does it mean for your company? Now you're part of a company that will be um, uh, employee owned, uh, so to speak, and we'll explain exactly what that means for you and your company moving forward. What does it mean to be an ESOP owner? Okay, this, this concept of of uh, ownership mentality and being an owner of a company. What does it mean? So that's what we're going to talk about today.
The acronym uh, ESOP, ESOP, stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Um, ESOPs are a product uh, out of the 1970s uh, ERISA legislation. Uh, ESOPs were, uh, were formed uh, at the federal government level because your legislatures uh, felt that transferring equity into the hands of workers in a company was a good thing, okay? A good thing for the com country, a good thing for the company, and a good thing for the economy. So it's a a national program with federal laws that govern it. It's a retirement benefit, and we, we need to understand that. This is uh, intended as a wealth-building exercise for you at retirement. Now, there's, there are some uh, rules and policies that will allow um, cashing in, so to speak, on, on your wealth uh, uh, before you retire, but we will explain that. The ESOP holds company common stock, and that common stock is held in a trust. Uh, only the company pays for this benefit. Okay? Um, this is important to understand. If you see the, the little symbol here on uh, the blue symbol in the lower right-hand corner, you're going to recognize that throughout this presentation and many other educational sessions that talk about ESOPs. Okay? Um, and you'll understand that, uh, that that symbol looks kind of like a wagon wheel with ESOP in the middle. That center section uh, ha has a purpose. That's where the stock re resides before it's, quote, allocated into the, the um, sections on the outside of that wheel. And we'll talk about that. Some facts about ESOP. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's a federal program and it's regulated by the IRS and our friends at the Department of Labor. So there are some administrative issues and some legal issues that are really important to, to managing ESOP. There are a lot of companies with ESOPs in the United States, uh, probably close to 12,000 companies that have an ESOP. And in those companies, there are well in excess of, of 10 million employees that work in companies that have ESOPs. As I mentioned before, it's a trust, and, it's, and you'll hear that often throughout this presentation. And because it's a trust, and it's really the sole owner of, of the company, it needs to, to have a trustee. And the trustee has very serious fiduciary responsibilities uh, uh, within the plan, and one of, it's one of the key positions, administrative positions, for your ESOP. We refer to it as beneficial ownership because legally you don't own the stock, you own a, a, per, a uh, you participate in the ownership of the trust. Kathy is going to take you through a brief survey. Uh, we decided that one of the challenges with doing one of these on a webinar is uh, we don't get to hear much from you. So we're going to ask you, we're going to make these statements, these four statements, and we're going to ask you to vote what you think the answer is. What's your opinion? What's your perception? I'm going to go through them one at a time. And for those of you that are on a, uh, a screen, you can just click the answer and, uh, and it will, we're doing a poll and it will collect your answer. And then for those of you that are in Houston, I have asked Stacy to help me by giving you, each person needs to take four sheets of paper, and on it you will write T or true, false or F, or N, NS or not sure, depending on what your answer is. And Stacy's going to collect them one at a time. Are you ready, Stacy? Oh, wait a minute. Yes, yes. we're ready. Okay. Here, we're all ready. Okay. The, let the voting begin. I'm going to go to the first one. Okay. This is the first statement. We want you to give us your opinion on it. ESOPs generally pay retirees somewhat below fair market value oh. for their stock. Okay. Wait a minute. Don't give us the answer that you're going to give. Those of you that are online, if you could click in front of you the, your answer and everybody else, uh, do your uh, secret voting, and then at the end, we're going to tabulate it and compare. 
Okay, we, we are getting some voting in. You know, this is anonymous for, uh, we're trying to make it as anonymous as possible for those of you in Houston. Okay, so if you would collect all the responses for in Houston and put them in a pile, tell me when you're done. And we're, we're almost ready to close the poll. We only have three votes for those of you that are online. So I'm guessing that that's, uh, those three votes are in. Okay, we're closing it, closing the poll, and going to the next one. Are you ready, Houston? Yes. Okay. Now, the next question, or the next statement is, every equity engineering employee has responsibilities to work to improve the company's stock value. What do you think? True, false, not sure. Okay, we're closing the poll. And those of you that are uh, in Houston, are you ready for the next question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Statement number three, outside investors who might buy equity engineering would not change our business. True, false, not sure. Okay, are we ready to, oh, wait a minute. We're ready. I think I went too far here. Yeah, can you? I'm not sure if mine got in or not. We only got one response. Vote again. I went to click it and it, it changed before. Oh, did it change? Okay, wait one minute. Here. We haven't closed that. Okay. I don't know. If my, I don't know if it went in or not. Okay. Well, okay. I don't know how this. I messed up here. That's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the final question is, um, ESOPs generally grow at the same pace as others in their industry. True, false, not sure. Okay, are we ready? You got all those piles? We will come back to the responses at the end of this. We just thought we'd, we'd kind of get you thinking about the things that we're going to talk about. We're going to close the poll. Okay. Okay. So, uh, we're going to move on to uh, talking a little bit about, Jay's going to talk about why uh, an ESOP for your company. Yeah. And then this uh, it, we, we turns to uh, a little bit of David's uh, opening remarks. Uh, we want to talk about that because it's so important, the, the transition period. Uh, why, an, why an ESOP for equity engineering? Well, we need to step back and realize that all privately owned businesses have a challenge of ownership succession, what we call planning for the exit of the owners. And it's really not all, all privately owned businesses, it's all businesses in general will change ownership. If you think about a publicly traded company, they're changing ownership virtually minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. But in a private company, it's very, very important because that seller may or may not make the decision to, uh, to change the ownership. Hopefully, they're making a conscious decision that's well-planned. Often, it's necessitated by circumstance. It could be the death of the owner, for instance. Okay? So not addressing this succession planning challenge can really destroy a business. Uh, it happens all the time. Or at least severely damage it, a business that, that's healthy. Okay? There are a number of challenges for business, business owners, especially small business owners, uh, in, in the succession process. As a, as a small business owner is looking at the prospects of changing ownership, the first question is, what are my choices? I could sell to a competitor. I could um, uh, change ownership to my son or daughter, keep it within the family. Uh, I could sell it to management. 
uh, often they don't even realize of the existence of a tool called ESOP. Um, employee ownership uh, through an ESOP is something that we really strive to talk about more and more, and it's becoming more and more popular because, it's, it, because in some situations it is the best solution. Uh, that last bullet <clears throat> indicating that uh, some of what David, David indicated, that um, other options for equity engineering possibly would have eliminated the company or could have resulted in liquidation or sale or sale to a larger company. Got to hit hard. Really, equity engineering was between a rock and a hard place, and, and in some respects they dodged a bullet. Uh, after talking with management, we've learned that cashing out the shareholders as a group would have incurred a severe financial burden for the business, and that really took that option off the table. Because think about it, uh, any sale, m most sales of a business involve some kind of a debt that's incurred by the business as it goes forward, okay? And having to cash out those shareholders would have been a financial um, burden on the company. Plus, uh, we understand that at least for the first half of 2012, the performance did not make equity engineering a particularly attractive company to sell. Um, the valuation process that all companies go through in looking to, to change ownership um, was a bit of a moving target through the first part of 2012. We understand that the last half of 2012 was outstanding, so you recovered. The, the ESOP was a good choice um, because one of the reasons it was a good choice is that there are some significant tax advantages for ESOP companies uh, as an operating company. One of them is that a 100% ESOP company that's organized as what's known as an S corporation pays no federal income tax. Let me repeat that. They don't pay federal income tax, okay? So the cash flow is really an advantageous position. In addition, an ESOP company pays no uh, tax on the principal and the interest in paying back the loan. So there's an, there's a, an operating example. Uh, in some respects, those, those advantages really made the ESOP uh, and the sale of the company possible. Okay. Also in some conversations with management, it was very obvious that the equity engineering company itself uh, has a lot of qualities that are worth preserving. As you heard David say, um, it was the desire of the sellers to sustain the business, continue the business. They wanted the business to stay alive. Uh, they wanted the employees to share in the future of the company and as a result uh, have a stake in its, in its uh, success. So the ESOP solves the challenge of succession. ESOP, in this case, was the best choice, and uh, the, the company uh, has chosen the ESOP because uh, of all the other choices, the ESOP was the best choice. I talked about the tax advantages that will help pay off the debt that was incurred. Uh, we understand that the debt was approximately 11, 11 years for the selling owners, and according to financial analysis, um, and the projections that should be manageable. VSOP maintains a stable long-term ownership, okay? It's, it's, the, it's the workers. It's the workers owning through the ESOP trust. It's a heck of a reward for employees. We'll talk more about the specifics of the, of the reward and the wealth building that it can represent. And it sustains a company that already has great people, strong relationships, internal and external relationships with their customers, really some uh, great compensation package and, and benefit package and uh, uh, great uh, expertise within its industry. 
the size of your benefit in the future depends on your performance. Um, here are some ba four simple bullets, but I think there's some very basic principles to con continually keep in mind. The stock increases or decreases with company performance. Again, this is not a publicly traded company, so you're not at the whims of the stock market, right? There's a valuation that occurs at least once a year, and that will determine your stock value. And what is, what is the major contributor to that stock value? It's the company performance. It's the bottom line. It's profit. Okay? And the value of the stock is not guaranteed. The value of, this, of, of a share of stock of equity engineering could be extremely high or it could be zero. Okay? It's all up to the employees. And as I said, it's on a different track from, a, from the public markets. We're not on the stock market. You're not on the stock market. And the size of the benefit depends on the additions and growth. By additions, we mean the contributions that are made to the, the ESOP by the company through its profits and the growth of the value of stock, so in both ways. The, uh, the committee suggested that we uh, do a little comparison between uh, ESOP and 401k because we thought that you know, 401k is something that many people are familiar with, and so this might give you some perspective on, you know, how does this compare? So I'm going to go through some questions. Um, if you are in a room where this is small, um, we're sorry we tried to load a lot on this slide. Um, first, let's talk about what it's invested in. Um, for those of you that are familiar with 401k, and 401k is invested in uh, funds that you select. And oftentimes, if you're in equities, you're in the public market. Um, in the ESOP, uh, the stock is all in one company. And so you will hear people say, all your eggs are in one basket. Well, it's true. All of your eggs in an ESOP are in one basket. But it is a very different kind of basket than in a 401k fund. A fund would be diversified with the intention of spreading the risk in many different places. With that, there, that limits the potential for growth. So spreading the risk really um, lowers your opportunity for growth. With an ESOP, it is that portion of your retirement now is all your eggs in one basket. But for some of you, it may be a basket that, you're pretty, uh, that you think is pretty good. And uh, it has a much higher potential for growth. And, a much, and it does have higher risk as well because what you're risking is can we be a success as a business? And can we continue our track record of success? And so with an ESOP, uh, you know, a lot of ESOP companies say that having an ESOP and your own 401k investments is really a, a nice complement to each other because an ESOP is a wealth building opportunity. We've worked in ESOP companies. You know, if you're used to getting returns in your 401k uh, at 8% or 10% or thinking that 15% would be great, you, we need you to know that ESOP stock can grow at a level of 20% uh, a year, 50% a year, 100% a year, 200% a year. You know, that stock in one company tends to, can grow much faster, and so it has higher potential for, for growth. Um, and, you know, and then it has higher potential for risk, but think about it, what are you risking? You didn't pay for it. It is, you know, those, it's coming to you because of your, uh, the fact that you have W-2 in the, in the company. Okay, so that's like, what is it invested in? Now, does it change with the stock market? Um, 401k, obviously, if you are in equity funds, it's going to go up and down with the value of the stocks that are in that fund. Um, the ESOP is very different, and that's also an advantage for building wealth. Um, we worked with companies in those times when the stock market took a dive and many ESOP companies went up in value in those years. Even though a component of the valuation has to do with how other companies are doing, it is primarily, the appraisal is primarily dependent on uh, what's going on with your company. So an independent firm is hired one time a year to determine what that value is, what fair market value is. 
you know, it's what would somebody pay for a share of stock in this company? So regardless of what's going on out in the, in the uh, public markets, you know, when the stock market takes a dive, ESOP investments don't take a dive. They will reflect your company's performance. And so, you know, I'm skipping ahead to the next question, which is how is value determined? Obviously, in the 401k, it's what somebody is willing to pay out there in the public market, buyers and sellers, and that value in the 401k changes moment to moment, right? You can log on and see. The difference with an ESOP is only one time a year will that, uh, will that stock value change, and you will get a report on that in the middle of the year after it closes. And the reason is because there is a need to hire this independent appraisal firm. That independent appraisal firm has to do a detailed analysis of what would an investor pay to own a share of stock in equity engineering. And that careful analysis takes time. Um, we would expect that your statements for the end of 2012 will come out sometime in uh, the summertime because of, and we can talk more about the process that it takes, because of the fact that it, there are many professionals involved and the analysis has to happen. But because of that, because of that delay, I think sometimes people feel like nothing's happening, and I bet there's some frustration out there. Um, this delay is a normal delay. It's because you're a private company, and there you have to determine what the value is. But uh, that doesn't mean just because those shares, you have not gotten a report on those shares, it doesn't mean that they are not uh, growing in value because it really has to do with uh, this, with your performance every single year. So we want you to know that the reporting is delayed, but the money, the, the growth of that, of those uh, shares is not delayed. Um, okay, so what's the source of the investment? Obviously, in a 401k, the source is your own deferrals, your own contributions, and a company paid match if there's a company paid match. Something that a lot of people are uh, not familiar with is the fact that 401k matches, unless they are uh, required by the plan, are discretionary. In uh, companies with uh, generous uh, compensation packages where people have gotten really nice benefits, people get kind of used to that 401k match. Um, technically speaking, the equity engineering match is discretionary. And so last year it was dis, you know, discontinued, as I uh, understand. And, uh, and you should know that in a lot of companies that are distressed or that have a difficult year, uh, the 401k contributions go away. Now, so some of the 401k is paid for by the company. Most of it is paid for by the employee. The difference here with an ESOP is 100% of what goes into the ESOP is paid for by the company. You can't buy additional shares and you can't make a contribution to the ESOP. It is company paid. You earn allocations based on the fact that you have W-2 in the company for the year. So um, what we're looking at is uh, you know, two different sources that also is, makes uh, companies that have an ESOP and a 401k where you can do your own savings, those companies tend to have higher retirement incomes than uh, comparable conventional companies. Now, if you go to the next uh, uh, question, you know, there's the question of can you change your investments in 401k? You can move them anytime, moment to moment. In an ESOP, generally they stay in company stock. Um, there is a provision after 10 years, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, to, uh, for people who are 55 years old can move some of those investments to something like their 401k, more diversified. And then the final question is, you know, can I uh, affect this in the way I do my job every day? And I think this is the essence of the difference between these two investments. In the 401k, you put your dollars in, and you, uh, and you hope that they're going to make money with your money. In the ESOP, this part of your retirement is directly dependent on how you do your work every single day, on reaching your company goals, on meeting your customers' expectations, and growing the business. And this actually is, uh, I've heard some ESOP companies say, you know, people say, well, I can move things around in my 401k, but I can really control 
uh, whether or not I satisfy this customer and whether or not I help grow this business. And so it, it is a very different kind of retirement plan. The similarities are that they are both uh, governed by the Department of Labor and the IRS and the 401k. Uh, if you're familiar with the rules to the 401k, you will, in terms of uh, distribution, you'll understand the ESOP rules a little bit better because the taxation and all those are the same. Kathy, let's stop for just a second and see if there are any questions about this particular slide or maybe uh, something earlier. Oh, come on. Some of you got to have questions out there. <laughs> or concerns. Now, if you do, if you want to write them in the chat box, one of the functions of the ESOP Communication Committee is to collect those questions and make sure that there are answers that people get to their questions. So if you're thinking something, you're thinking, ah, oh, well, come on, you know, I don't think this is true. You know, this is the time, or get it to the member of the ESOP Communications team that is uh, in your location. I got, I got a question for you. It says right. that you're, you're saying the equity engineering is paying for all additions to the ESOP. Yes. So pre presumably some of this money comes from what would have gone into 401k contributions in the past. Absolutely. But, uh, and, uh, I, but that's probably not enough to cover it. So, uh, you got basic, it. So uh, presumably after 11 years, all the contributions together have added up to enough to pay off the principal and interest of this note that's coming up, right? Okay. So that's, yeah, that's so good. We're going to go. We're going to go through this in a little bit more detail, but I think you're on to something that's a really good concept, which is part of it. Okay, there's some some extra dollars available in the budget based on the fact that there is uh, that the the um, 401k match is now going to uh, help pay for ESOP. But you have to keep in mind that and when you put an ESOP in, if the company is profitable, the company now uh, does not have to pay for federal income tax. And before, what, ha what had to happen was payments had to be made to shareholders so that they could pay their income taxes. Now, those dollars that would have gone to the federal government are now going to help pay for this ESOP. And it, it's promoting the sharing of ownership. It's what, it's what the intention of an ESOP is. And so that's one of the places. So you know, when you're saying that that isn't going to cover it all, yeah. Now let's go through your other question and then interrupt me again if I don't answer it. When we take a little bit closer look at the trust, it might help you see technically or mechanically what's, gonna, what's happening. Um, as Jay mentioned, we're going to use this little model as a way of explaining the ESOP. It's a little bit like a bag that's got pockets all the way around the outside. And on the inside, there's that one big circle, and that is going to hold the shares before they are released. Okay? So we're going to use, you have, you have to imagine, you know, hundreds of pockets around the outside. When you get your statement every year, you will get a statement of how many shares are in your account, what are they worth, and it's also going to tell you how much you're vested in those. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so the suspense account is this middle pocket, and it's going to hold the shares before they are paid for. So let's talk about how the shares got into the trust. Um, every year, there is a requirement that anybody who has an ESOP, uh, the value of the shares has to be determined by an independent uh, appraisal firm and it has to be independent of the company, and the, that value is the only value that an ESOP can purchase shares for. A, an ESOP is not allowed to purchase shares at above fair market value. So here's the steps of what happened. First, an independent firm determined fair market value. The former shareholders agreed to sell 100% of their shares and take IOUs, or take notes, and the ESOP bought 100% of the company's shares with bar basically with borrowed money. And the, and the ESOP now has IOUs to those shareholders or has, you know, there are notes to pay those shareholders in over roughly 11 years. 
it may be that there will be a, a moment in time that the, the, uh, there may be times when the Board of Directors decides that they would make larger contributions to the ESOP and accelerate those payments, but it's on a schedule, a, a basic schedule over about 11 years. Now, the shares are initially going to be held in the suspense account, but when the company makes a contribution to the ESOP annually, which will, will include, will, will be the size that you were saying of, uh, of those uh, um, 401k match, but also additional. So that contribution is going to the ESOP. Those dollars will be used to repay some of those notes. If one eleventh of the, of the notes are repaid, one eleventh of the shares are released into the individual accounts. And so if you look at it when they're initially in a suspense and then every year some of those shares are released into the individual accounts. We're going to go more into detail about how those are allocated. So the trust itself holds 100% of the shares of the company. They are just moving out into the individual accounts over a period of years. So if you're uh, you know, thinking about this trust fund, it is an entity that has a lot of eyes looking at it. Um, there is an ESOP trustee and there's an ESOP administrative committee who are in, inside your company, but those people are not alone. Those people have advisors. There is an independent appraisal firm and an ESOP administrator. And those two firms every year help the ESOP administration team and the trustee to do, the, to do their job. Um, the IRS and everybody is inside the box of the IRS and the Department of Labor regulations. So if you ever run across a, something you say, now why is this so complicated? Some of the reason is because in order to get this significant tax advantage and be able to, if you look at what you did, get this smooth transition of ownership to, uh, to a new group of people, you really need to do what the IRS and the Department of Labor wants you to do. Okay, so here are uh, some people who are uh, playing the role. Um, the trustee is James Sawinski. Now, James is not alone. There is a committee of individuals uh, who, that ESOP administrative committee, they instruct James on how to uh, make decisions based, based, that have to do with the trust. And let's talk about some of the things that they would decide. One time a year, evaluation needs to be done. It is the trustee, technically speaking, who hires that independent valuation. And the administrative committee and the trustee would look at the, that value and look at the assumptions of that value. Um, they are the people who decide on how to interpret the plan. They are not the people on the other side of this slide who make strategic decisions about how to run the business. Okay, so on the right-hand side, you have the people who have to worry about their job is to operate the trust solely in the interest of participants. On the other side, they have a very similar role. The board of directors of the company has to guide the operation of the business, but guide it uh, prudently to grow shareholder value. Those are the words. And so they are guided by the uh, the job of looking at what are the, the, the strategic direction that this business needs to go in order to grow shareholder value. Now, your company has done something that it never has in the past, as I understand, and you have an advisory board which has outsiders who advise the business, and, that, and that's Joe Corsaro and Christy Liris. And then Christy is with Vistage, and Joe, as you know, is a, uh, is a lawyer who uh, helped you put together this transaction. Um, so those are the people, these people I put on here because they're really uh, on, on the hot seat. The people on the left-hand side are responsible for the business and the people on the right-hand side are responsible for making sure that the trust operates for the financial interest of participants. So I got a little graphic here that shows everybody in yellow has a fiduciary or a legal responsibility. What this essentially means is, you know, usually people are thinking, now wait a minute, so we're employee owned with this ESOP, does that mean that people in decision making positions can, can make decisions that are in their interest? And that is actually the big no-no for anybody in yellow. 
those folks have to make decisions that have, that are, they can't make any decisions that they call are self-dealing, which means if they make a decision, it needs to be in the interest of, on the right-hand side, all participants, and on the left-hand side, prudent for growing shareholder value. So if you ever need to, you know, ask, you know, why are people making decisions, they're going, they are, anybody in those seats has a legal responsibility, you know, a can-be-sued kind of a responsibility to make sure they're making prudent decisions for your benefit. Any questions on that one? Okay, I'm going on. Now, the next question people say is, okay, so what are my rights as an owner? You are not a direct owner. You are a beneficiary of a trust fund. And so let's talk a little bit about what the law creates for in terms of required communication. Here's what the law requires. And frankly, you know, it's not much. The law does not require the company to provide any, really any information to you. But these top three bullets are the required communication. The first is a summary plan description. You have already received one of these for your 401k. In the next year, uh, you will get one that describes the rules to the plan for the ESOP. In a few minutes, um, Jay and I are going to talk about those and give you the highlights of it. That's required by law. <coughs> Something called a summary annual report is required by law. It will frustrate those of you that are thinking it's going to tell you anything about the company. The summary annual report is just going to tell you how many shares are in the center of the ESOP, how many shares are in those outside in the individual accounts. It's going to do a reporting of the contributions that were made for that year. Um, so uh, that's not an annual report on the company financials, by the way. Uh, then every year you are required to get an annual statement of your individual account, and that will tell you how many shares you have, what they're worth, and how much you can call your own or how much is vested. So that's it. That's all the law requires. Now below is, are the decisions that would be passed through to participants if they ever happen. Um, so in most cases, the trustee votes the shares for shareholder issues, which in private companies, not many come up. But for example, a change on the board of directors, that would be the, vote, the trustee would vote those shares at the direction of the administrative committee. Um, but for, uh, for the five issues that we have listed, if those ever came up, you would get a lot of paperwork and you would be, you would instruct the trustee on how to vote the shares in your account. Um, and those you can see are uh, significant issues. You know, if there were uh, ever a proposal for merger, if there were ever a proposal for liquidating the company or selling substantially all the assets, if the company were to recapitalize, send a bunch of shares out to an investor or reclassify those shares, you know, going public, something like that. These don't come around very often. So essentially, uh, the required communication is really very, very limited. But we want you to know that your company has chosen to go way beyond the, the minimum requirements. And remember, what, you know, what's guiding those people in the yellow boxes is it has to be uh, for the benefit of participants and it has to be uh, to grow shareholder value. And so these things that you see on, on this list are really designed to help your company to become the kind of company that can succeed as an employee-owned business. That's why there's an ESOP communication committee. That's why you will see more information coming out about company performance. Um, this is in progress. There have been some experiments done on how to, to present this information. It's not finalized in how to do it. But your, it's your company's intention to get the right kind of information that people understand so that you can make better decisions in your, at the job level. Um, uh, there is uh, going to be a focus on increased business education for everybody and learning how the, the game of business together, learning what's driving success and a stronger focus on shared responsibility and accountability. This is, this is the plan going forward. It's not required when you put an ESOP in, but this is where your company wants to go. And there's some really good reasons for doing that. And the reason is that uh, 
when employees in an employee stock ownership plan company think and act like owners, there are performance benefits. The national studies show that, the, that ESOP companies outperform others in their industry. And I put a little link in there because I was told that there are some analytical folks on the phone. There might be some of you who uh, would want to go look at those uh, studies. They are at, and I'm, if you can't see it, it's, you go to nce.org, the National Center for Employee Ownership, and they have uh, several pages of, uh, of studies that have to do with company performance and ESOPs. And basically, here's what those say. And you have to go to their articles section, by the way. So the studies show what they did was they took ESOP companies and they compared them to others who are uh, in comparable conventional companies. And they followed them for 10 years. And they said, OK, is it true that ESOP companies are likely to outperform others in their industry? People have been saying it, but this, this longitudinal study really looked at it. And what they found is that ESOPs do tend to outperform uh, comparable conventional companies in terms of sales and also in terms of growth. Now, one of the reasons, obviously, is because there's this tax advantage and they have more cash to grow with. But there have been other studies that show they looked even deeper. They said, okay, now which ESOPs are really making this happen? And the ones that are making it happen are the ones that are, uh, have a culture of ownership. They're the companies where people are thinking and acting like owners, an environment where they call it a participative ESOP. Those ESOPs are likely to outperform others in their industry uh, 8 to 10%. They grow 8 to 10% faster than others. And there are even some in that study that were non-participative that did worse than the others in their industry, and they had an ESOP. Now, what that shows you is that the employees, the actions of employees, and the way people look at their job, and the way people run the business in, in their day-to-day -day work has an impact on whether ESOPs are a success. And it's up to you. Oh, there's a question. And uh, the question is, what are some of the major expenses of putting in an ESOP? Um, one of those, since I've already talked about them, we might as well answer that right now. Uh, one of those is every year that independent valuation, it's required that you have an independent valuation and you need to hire a professional to do that. Um, uh, there's also the cost of administering it, just like a, when a 401k, when you have a 401k, you have the cost of administering it. Do you want me to address that? Yeah. Also? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with regards to the the major expenses to put the ESOP in, uh, at least with equity, our major expense was setting it up. Um, when we go to the maintenance of it, if we, while we still will file IRS paperwork. The, the, the money saved and not actually having to do the taxes and file them formally will more than offset any of the costs to maintain the ESOP. To give you an idea, just to throw some numbers out, um, our, third, our third party plan minister administration company is about $4,000 a year, four, four to $4,500 uh, a year. Okay, so we're not talking about a lot of money to uh, maintain the ESOP at all. And and the the, it, the better you do, the bigger that ad, that advantage, that tax advantage is. And so, for ESOP companies that are doing well, uh, those those extra expenses are nothing. Yeah, and with regard also to liability insurance, um, everybody that is in yellow is covered by um, insurance. Yeah, that's already been put in place. Yeah. They're covered uh, for. The, for normal decisions, but if they were to do something sneaky or uh, or fraudulent, well, of course, those people could be sued for that. Okay. So, so Ken, do we uh, answer we your question? We yeah. Well, one one last thing, just to give give a rough number, the annual evaluation, I believe, is somewhere between eight and ten thousand dollars. Yeah. And you guys, by the way, I, as the outsiders, we will add that the firm that you use for your valuation is one of the most respected in the country, and so you know you, you are you're getting a very high quality analysis from Stout Resus Ross. And they're local. 
and that, yeah, they're local. Okay, um, so let's go back to this idea of, you know, part of the, uh, of, wh of whether you're a success is whether or not people are thinking and acting like an owner. And this list here that you have in front of you was created by your executive team. And it really reflects the, now that we're an ESOP, what do we expect of ourselves? What do we expect this company to do? If we're going to get those benefits of, of, uh, of high-performance ESOP, if you're going to be a healthy company that sustains itself into the future, what, what do we need to be doing? And here's the list that they came up with. And this is just kind of a vision. Um, you're, if you're going to think and act like an owner in your company, they said that you've got to pay attention to how your job affects overall business success, hence the business education. Um, be accountable for your actions. Learn about the big picture. Support business strategies that are being implemented. And I think this is something that in every company, uh, employees would, you know, uh, people expect their employees to, uh, to support their business strategies. But it's even more important in an ESOP company that once you have selected a direction, that people pull in the same direction, because that's how companies uh, build wealth together. That you, you know, there are many strategies in a business. There's not one right way, but once you pick one, you got to go with it. Um, maintaining strong relationships. Uh, I, as I understand it, it's one of the great things about, this is what we were told from your leadership, that one of the great things about working here is that there's good people and great relationships. Um, this uh, ESOP communication committee is an effort at improving the communication uh, among coworkers. Uh, and respecting the roles and expertise of others in your company, I think that in, as you grow bigger as a company and as, now that you are an ESOP company, being able to understand what's your role, what's your decision, and what somebody else's is an essential part of being effective as a business. And so we're going to be talking more about that in some training going forward. Yeah. Just before we leave this slide, move on to the next one, I just want to add, um, I think you, you get the feeling from what we've been talking about so far that, that in this presentation and the discussion surrounding ESOPs, there's two main areas. One is, how does it work? What are the mechanics? What's the technical side of an ESOP? And you need to understand that. But a whole different area that's really associated with employee ownership is this thing we're call calling culture. In this slide, thinking and acting like an owner is the culture side, right? So I just encourage you to, to be aware of, of each of those major areas. How does it work? What are the mechanics? But what does it mean in terms of how we behave as employees? So uh, the training that you're going to get from this day forward all right, will address one of those two major areas, you know, how it works or how do we act as, as employee owners. So let's talk about really what's near and dear to your heart, I'm sure, which is how is this thing going to benefit me? You know, what's in it for me? Right? And to do this, uh, we've come up with um, a list of what we call shuns. ESOP shuns, um, you're going to recognize fairly quickly that, that uh, the ESOPs have a whole vocabulary of their own, a whole glossary of terms, if you will, that you really need to understand. And five of them are, are listed here, participation, contri contribution, allocation, valuation, distribution. Understanding those five concepts will go a long way toward helping you understand what ESOP is all about. <laughs> the wrong one. Okay. Let's start with participation. Here we're going to focus on how do I get in this thing? Okay. When do I, you know, how do I enter this, this whole world of ESOPs? Okay. Uh, the, um, the participation rules are, are relatively simple. Uh, a participant needs to be at least 21 years old and work for employee um, equity engineering in the U.S. I, I, we, and we didn't say it at the outset, we probably should have, that this whole presentation about ESOP uh, is focused on the people that uh, work uh, in the United States, pay U.S. taxes. This is a U.S. program. We know we have Canadian employees of equity engineering and we have outside the U.S. Uh, employees uh, 
unfortunately, this plan is a U.S.-based retirement plan. Okay? Um, the entry date for uh, a, a uh, employee coincides with the eligibility for participation. So it, I, I, we can almost use these words interchangeably. That's participation in the plan, being eligible for the plan, and entry into the plan. Okay? Uh, not necessarily all ESOPs are set up that way, but I think it's a real advantage and a good thing that yours is set up that way. Uh, an exception would be for those employees that were the selling owners. Uh, they're not eligible to enter the plan while their loans are still unpaid. Any questions here? So we have a special rule, so we want to make sure you know about it, because I'm sure some of you are going, wait a minute, counting from what year? What are we talking about? Uh, anyone who is 21 years old and was employed when the plan was put into effect on October 1st, you're in the plan, you don't need to get 1,000 hours in that plan year because obviously October 1st to December 31st you cannot uh, get 1,000 hours. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. <laughs> okay, so continuing with this, uh, with our, our little graphic showing the cycle of contribution, allocation, and valuation, um, those three occurrences happen on an annual basis. Um, the distribution happens obviously, which is the payout of an employee's value that they have accumulated in the ESOP trust. That, that payout, known as distribution, occurs when you leave the company. Um, so uh, this graphic, I, I think, shows that pictorially. And uh, we're going to talk about each one. Yeah, each one individually. The ESOP contribution is an amount that's approved by the Board of Directors. That's the important fact here. Um, each year, the Board of Directors uh, determines based on the, on the performance of the company, the specific contribution amount that will be, be made to the trust. And that contribution amount can vary greatly between zero and about 25% of total payroll of the company. Right? Obviously, the cash is cont contributed to the ESOP trust. That's used to pay the notes that are owed to selling owners. And that activity then trigger triggers uh, an action that's, uh, that's known as allocation. What is allocation? Okay. Well, let's get stock into your individual account. Kathy touched on it earlier, but let's hit it again. Uh, allocation is dividing the contribution that's made into the ESOP trust, the middle of that, that wheel, among the individual ESOP participants after they're eligible to participate. Okay. To get that allocation requires 1,000 hours uh, in a calendar year, and the, ca the calculation is made this way. It's your compensation, so it's based on compensation level. So the relationship of your compensation to all ESOP participants' compensation in the, um, in the plan, and that yields a percentage. Then that percentage is multiplied by the number of ESOP shares that are being released. Again, based on the allocation, a, the, the shares from the suspense account are released into the individual participant accounts, and uh, that is the allocation in your particular ESA. I'll answer this question. We have a question? Done, when you're done with the next one, I'll answer that question. Okay. So here's an example, okay? Uh, Bart's wages are $50,250 a year, and let's just assume for for conversation that the total compensation for the participants is $5 million. That's a 0.001 percentage times 250 shares. Let's just use that as an example. So in Bart's account, he gets 2.5 shares. Okay? Any questions there? Okay. 
I'm going to answer a, a complicated question. I don't want to, everybody doesn't have to an, understand the answer to this, but I'm going to answer it for the person who asked it. it. The question is, doesn't the contribution also have to pay interest on the notes? And the answer is yes. And visually, uh, here I'm going to I'm going to go to the next slide because I think it helps you think it through a little bit. That contribution is uh, is going to pay both principal and interest on the notes to the sellers. And the way that they calculate splitting it up is they take they take all the principal and interest that's owed on this over the life of that. Uh, of those obligations, and they say if one eleventh of that obligation is paid, one eleventh of the shares are released. So does that make sense? So that, yes, there are there's interest on the notes, and that paying interest on the notes also helps release shares into the individual accounts as well, because it's all part of that obligation. Anybody want me to elaborate on that? Somebody's taken us to very advanced ESOP. That's good. Yeah, but this, <laughs> yeah, these, these previous few slides are important. They understand. So, uh, any questions there? But I'd like to add one yeah. thing. The um, as we're going through this, when it gets down to paying off the notes, the sellers want those notes paid off as fast as possible because the interest doesn't come close to the growth potential. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, if if you're thinking, oh man, they're getting interest, well, uh, you know, they probably love to be a part of the growth potential in uh, right. and owning equity. Right, and, and again, if you remember, none of the sellers are members of the ESOP until the notes are paid off, and that's actually a check and balance in the process. Yeah, and what that might do is it might mean when there's a little bit of when there's cash available, those notes are going to get paid down. Those notes get paid down, that's going to crank more shares out into the individual accounts. Great point, thank you. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about valuation, just so that you have a sense of the logic of what's going on when they come in every year and they say, what is this company worth? And really, their fair market value has a very long definition, but the essence, essence of it is this. What would somebody pay if they were looking for a financial return for share stock and equity engineering. And so that's what Stout Rhesus Ross's job is. They are hired by the trustee, technically speaking, the trustee hires them, and then the and then they have to provide a report on here's what we think stock value is. And the 2012 value we don't know right now um, because the books have not been closed yet and they haven't gotten their information, they haven't done their analysis. And so you will get that information generally in the middle of the, of the next calendar year is when ESOPs get them. And so here I'm going to ask you to got to be patient because this is not a quick process. When you're used to a 401k, you think, well, why can't you tell me what my value is? Well, in an ESOP, we have to hire professionals to go out and determine that value. So we will, you'll find that out when you get your statements in the middle of the year. Now let's talk about the logic of the appraiser, because I think this is what helps people understand what's going on. There's really th four, three approaches that they uh, have to use. There's one additional approach that I'll tell you about, which is if the appraiser is aware of any transactions out there that happen in your industry, they can apply what they know about what those businesses were sold for. Um, but the first approach is the asset approach, and they really got to look at what the company owes and what the company owns. And in your transaction, your company uh, was able uh, has put an ESOP in without going out and borrowing any money from a bank. And that's a really wonderful thing, and that's a very healthy thing for your business going forward. Um, so the uh, appraiser is going to look at that and, and, uh, and see that there is not an obligation to a bank, but they're also going to look at the fact that in the trust, those shares are not yet paid for. So during before you've paid the loans down, the sh value of the shares is just going to show the equity portion of that, and I'm going to go through that in a minute. So paying down the notes is going to increase value on this part of the analysis. Um, the market approach is the next approach they have to do. And this is they're going to go look, try and find comparable companies that are in your industry in the public markets, and they're going to see what, what they're going for, what's their price compared to their earnings and then they apply that same logic to your company. If you were going to buy a company that's a private company, they discount it a little and say, what would somebody pay for this private company in the same industry? 
Most private companies, they have a difficulty finding comparable uh, firms, but they had to do the analysis. Um, and so for, uh, for your company, they probably went out and did the analysis, but had some difficulty finding anybody that you exactly compared to. Which it brings me to the last approach, which is the one that is generally weighted very heavily in private companies. And this is a, an approach that says, okay, if an investor is going to invest in your business, you know, what kind of future cash is this company likely to generate? And what they look at is your past profitability, your earnings, and they also look at you know, your track record for the last uh, five years or so. And then they look at the future and they say, how much do we believe that they're going to reach their company goals? What, what kind of future cash uh, is this company going to generate? And in that, you can see that meeting your business goals has a direct impact on this part of their analysis. They look at them all. They weigh them. There's no simple formula. They weigh them, and they put their judgment on what would somebody in this market pay. We've got about tw uh, 20 minutes left here. So. Okay. Okay, I'll get. I want to see us some time for questions at the end. Sure, I will go. I'll, I'll go through these. This is just to show you that in the beginning here, that uh, the value that you see on your statement is going to be only the equity portion. That debt is going to be taken off of the value, and so as the debt gets paid down, you can see you grow value. Okay. Um, we talked a little already a lot about uh, employee impact on value, and you know there are a lot of ways that people do that, and the things you do every day do have an impact on value. And your stock can grow, or your your account is going to grow in two ways. One is what's going in, and the second way is this change in value. So Jay's going to talk about uh, what a lot of people are thinking about. I know some of you might even look just like this guy right now. All right, all right. When do I get my money? Yeah, that's that's the bottom line, right? When do I get my money? Well, this brings us to the uh, the distribution, uh, and um, let's talk about that for a second. But before we we understand the, the policies on distribution, we need to touch on something you may be familiar with already, and that's vesting. Okay because your company has chosen to institute uh, what's known as a six-year gradual vesting. And this is, a, um, this is a span of time over which you are eligible to uh, take the money with you that is accumulated in your account. So you can see that at two years, you have vested in 20% of your account at three years, 40%, and so on, until at six, the six-year point, you are fully vested, and should you leave the company at that point, um, you are entitled to 100% of your account. And if you leave before that, you forfeit what is, uh, what is not vested, and that's reallocated among everybody else. And we might, we might mention here, it may be a question, uh, the partial year 2012, um, since nobody accumulated 1,000 hours in 2012, vesting starts at um, January 1st of 2013. That's the start of your vesting year. So, a couple kinds of distribution. One is what we call RDD, um, retirement, disability, or death. And your, your rules for retirement, your eligibility for retirement, is reaching the age 65. And at that point, you become 100% vested. And you may request the value, of your, the value of your account in the year after you leave. Okay? Payment can be spread out in either of these cases for a five-year period following your request for the, the value. If you leave for any other reason other than retirement, death, disability, or death, uh, then you look at the vesting schedule and you determine where you've reached, whether you've reached full vesting in that, in that six years. You may request value in the sixth year after you leave, and then the waiting period reflects the financial interests of the participants who have not left. Okay? Any questions on this? You may question uh, the, the waiting period and the flexibility the company has in, in spreading the payments out, but you think about it, um, 
This is a, um, an important area in the mechanics of the ESOP because it affects the financial condition of the company, especially the cash flow. So um, imagine the other extreme of having a policy where the company was under the obligation to pay 100 uh, percent of the uh, account immediately upon leaving the company for any reason whatsoever. Okay, that's an extreme, but believe it or not, some ESOPs are similar to that, and history shows that that could be devastating to the financial condition of the company because of that huge cash flow obligation that they would incur. So we want you to understand exactly what you're talking about. In a good year, everyone lines up and decides this is my year to leave, and it, and the company has an obligation to pay that. So we can guess at those things at the top, you know, when people are going to retire, what might be the odds of people becoming disabled or dying, but the leaving for another reason we can't predict, and that's why this is the longest you would have to wait. There may be circumstances that that's shortened up, but the committee needs to treat everybody the same who lines up for a distribution. And of course, uh, similar to a 401k, distributions uh, are taxable, but during the time that your wealth is building within your, your ESOP trust, there's no tax consequences whatsoever, but you're taxed at normal income rates at uh, distribution, or you can roll over your proceeds into an IRA and defer taxation, which uh, is commonly done. And uh, <clears throat> again, um, IRS requires that uh, the company withhold if, if you're getting cash. And there could be some uh, early withdrawal penalties based on your age. So that's pretty much it, Kathy. Uh, any questions on distribution? before we hit the pop quiz here. We got the final pop quiz for you. Okay, so the, this is the big question for you. What do you think? With an ESOP, do you get something for nothing? What do you think? Somebody give me your opinion. Do you pay for it? Yeah, <laughs> I, hear, I hear silence out there. Sometimes people say, yeah, I don't pay for it, but it, for some people it feels like they're paying for it because they're not getting their 401k uh, match. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is uh, you, are, you are required, you really can't pay for it. The company's the only one who can pay for it. But the real business of paying for it is going to come in the way that you do your work every day. And so this is kind of a trick question. Yeah, you don't pay for it immediately out of your pocket, but it's going to require that your company uh, continue a track record of success and that you make good decisions together in, in your day-to-day -day work. So let's go to the pop quiz. Now here's our answers. But let's see what your answers would have been. Uh, Stacy, can you uh, give us the question number one report? Uh, Stacy's not with us. She got called away. But I have her answer. Um, there was two for true, four false, and two not sure. All right. I like that disagreement. That's good. Okay. So and of our people who voted on... Uh, online, they all said true. Now we would, we, you know, ESOPs, uh, did, you, did you say true, is that true, those of you? No, I said false. Or, I'm sorry, you said, I, they all said false, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So we got three, you all said, you agree with us. So the ESOPs, uh, the rule, and we wanted you to get this, the rule is that ESOPs must pay fair market value. So that's the rule. So if there's ever any question of, hey, you know, did they pay too much for this? No, the rule is it had to be fair market value. And so when you leave, you must get fair market value, uh, which is what is determined by the independent appraisal firm who has a reputation to keep in the industry. And fair market value is just not a nebulous term. Uh, it's a meaningful term in, term in the appraisal world. And so, you know, you need to know that, and if there's ever a question about value, go back to that note. It has to play. So you can't get less than fair market value. Um, and an ESOP could not pay. 
is there a question? Yeah, this is the fair market value in the year when you request it. Is that or at the end of the yeah, year or in the, previous in the year? year? In, in the year in which you get your payment. Good question. Which That's is? a really good question. Which means in an ESOP company, when you leave, you want to make sure somebody great is continuing in your job, and you want to make sure that you leave this company healthy because it needs to remain healthy in order to pay you your value. Um, so the the uh, what some ESOP companies do is, you know, people were saying, oh, man, there's a six-year wait. Well, you might end up uh, getting an opportunity to cash your shares in early because stock value is going up. Well, that, that would be your choice at the time if they open that up. So it is in the year in which you get your payment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, question number two. Uh, each... Uh, equity engineering employee now has a responsibility to work to improve the business because the company stock is part of everyone's retirement. Um, uh, people online said true. What what did the what were your answers? Uh, six said true, and two not sure. Not sure. This is an opinion, clearly, but this is really the uh, new focus for your company that. Uh, and you ought to think of it this way, where decisions that were made in the past might have been, if they satisfied the shareholders, that, that was acceptable. But this is everybody's retirement now. And so there's an extra obligation to have some rigor in decision making. And so you'll, you know, if people are making decisions to spend dollars, it, it really has to do with, is this going to help us grow value, not just today, but in the future? Okay, um, question number three, outside investors who wanted to buy or who might have wanted to buy equity engineering wouldn't change the business at all. What do you think? We said false. That's our opinion. What, 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 how did you vote? I have a not sure that came through and some, there was a, a voting uh, error because I moved the slide forward too fast. When there was eight it? falses here. Eight falses. Yeah, it, this is a real perception thing, um, but not only is ESOP ownership an opportunity to grow wealth, but it also avoided the unpleasantness of being owned by somebody else. Um, okay, so quest, our statement number four, ESOPs generally grow at the same pace as others in the industry. And online, people are kind of split up. What, what did you say uh, in Houston? Three true, five false. Three true, five false. So we have three true, seven false, and one not sure if we count everybody's. The studies show, and we want you to, to know that, that the studies show that ESOPs tend to grow faster in sales and employment, but it really depends on company culture. And it's, it's when ESOPs are able to tap into the fact that everybody's thinking and acting like owners that they really perform. So qu other questions that you have, you can either write them in or you can uh, um, just talk out loud. And feel free to ask hard ones. If we, if we don't know the answer, the, uh, the committee will, will research it and get back to you. We're writing them down, so we want to make sure we collect all the questions. Or just comments, impressions. Oh, come on. Uh, we, we did this uh, in front of some, some folks yesterday and had, oh, lots of questions. About 10 or 11. Some of them, they, they stumped me on one of them. I said, you're going to have to ask the administrative firm on that one. So, please, there's got to be questions. And... We are making note of the ones that were, if you want to write them in chat, we're making note of those questions because what we want to make sure is we're going to collect the questions that come up most frequently and make sure that the ESOP Communication Committee is uh, armed with answers to those questions. Okay, as far as, as, far as the uh, allocation to the individual accounts, when the 
that when the contribution comes in, it has to pay for the interest for that year, and then I would imagine that whatever is left over is what's paying down the uh, principal. Okay, I'm going to go back. Is the, ba is the basis of how you're allocating the shares. In other words, just paying interest basically contributes zero to the individual accounts because you're just breaking even on that. So I would think that just what only the part that pays down the principal is going to buy shares. Is that right? That's not correct. The, right. In an ESOP, the release of shares is according to a formula defined in the plan. And your release of shares, they, there's actually a choice as to whether to release it on just principal or principal and interest. And I called around and I talked to your lawyer and talked to everybody and the release of shares is based on principal and interest. But it really doesn't matter. I mean, but it matters for the purposes of if there were ever just interest paid. In those, in those uh, periods, if you were just doing it on principal, you wouldn't get shares. But in the way yours is structured, and most ESOPs are on principal and interest, when they take the entire life of the obligation to those uh, shareholders or to the notes that are that are owed and they have it on a schedule and that schedule of principal and interest as you pay down on that schedule it releases shares proportional to the entire obligation including principal and interest does that make sense uh, in the plan, not, in not the, really in because you don't even know how long it's going to take to pay it off in other words, we're saying 11 years, but it could take nine or it could take 13. If you, if you accelerate in your payment along that schedule, it will release more shares according to the schedule. Yeah, that makes sense, but I don't see how you, well, I don't see how the interest part would work then, I guess. In, all it, they, it, is, it is just included it's as part possible. of what releases it. Yeah. It becomes part of the total obligation that the, the company needs to pay. Yeah, it and really all the all that loan is doing it doesn't you know what you you should be you're interested in how many shares am I getting and what are they worth that mechanical thing that releases the shares is really it it's it's the way the deal was done in the beginning and it's on a schedule and if you if they accelerate that schedule it releases more shares. Okay, That's a great great question, Ken. It is a very good question. But, but it, we want you to know that, uh, it, that paying interest releases really shares as well. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyone else? So for, our, for vesting purposes, the vesting will actually start in 2014 then, right? With the, all the people. In 2014, you, you, you yeah. get your 20 percent. So the first 20 per, first 20 percent is going to vest in 2014. The vesting schedule begins 1113. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> at the end of 2013, uh, if you're an employee for the entire year, you would have one year into the vesting schedule. You got one right. year in. If you're looking at the graphic. You, yeah, right. you're so still zero. In 2014, interest. then, is when the first 20 percent would be vested. Right. The, right. At the end for, of 2014. For, for those most employees that have been here both years. Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is a, it, an ESOP is a long-term wealth building opportunity. It's not a short-term uh, payout. And by that time, if you think about it, uh, you will have only had a couple of years of contributions you know, the real kicker is to stay in for the long haul. So I have a question. Uh, so now it's 2014, and there's another distribution. Those are um, on, a, on, a, on another vesting schedule, correct? Yeah. Oh, that's no. a great question. If, you, if anybody has ever worked at a public company and has gotten stock, they're used to that vesting schedule being attached to the shares. This is not attached to the shares. It's attached to the person. Ah. And your years of service, and you all want to learn that now because when you bring new people into the organization, they might misunderstand that the vesting schedule is attached to the shares. It's attached to you and your years in the ESOP. And so once you're at 
you're at 100% for anything that falls into your account after that. Whatever's in the account. Okay, that is a yeah. difference from yeah. the way I'm used to seeing it. Yeah, and I Great. think that, and I think that's something that you'll run into. It's 13, when you well, then it would be 13. What'd you say? I, I had a question on the distribution. If a person uh, leaves at six years, said there is uh, five years. Uh, they have a maximum of five years to pay you. Is uh, is that taken into account that the owners are paid off within the five years, or does does neither one have anything to do with the other? We're going we're gonna to address that question later. Um, in your plan, there is a, it's permissible to delay payments until the, until the shareholders are paid out. Um, this is uh, something that could be triggered because there's a cash, uh, a reason why the company cannot pay. Um, but mo most of the time in ESOPs, what happens is that this waiting period for people to be paid out is uh, is long enough that the company has significantly paid down that debt, and so yeah, there there is a provision that says, hey, if those if those shareholders aren't paid out, the company could uh, not begin making distributions. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, uh, this other waiting period is long enough. Who who asked the question? Houston. Houston. Who, who, who at Houston? Because I want to make sure that we Clint, understand the Clint Berkey, B-U-R-K-E-Y. Okay. Clint, so, I'll, I'll, I'd like to, um, we're going to write down the question here, figure out what it is. I'll get that question to you, and you can say, yes, that is, uh, you did understand, and then we'll answer it to everybody. But uh, I do want to check with you to make sure we, we understand your question. Yeah. It's a, it is, I, I, we didn't put it on the slide because we thought that that uh, provision generally does not uh, come into play because that waiting period, you know, somebody leaves, there is a five-year wait, and then the next year they are, uh, they may request. So it's, a, it's quite a waiting period. Other questions? Just out of curiosity, you said after the ESOP is 10 years old, you, some participants might be eligible to diversify the ESOP or something like that. What, the, what okay. exactly does that mean? I that's mean, a, this that's is, a this great is, question. This is, this, is a long, this is a long ways off, but I, that's a peculiar thing to Okay, think about. so if you think about it, for some of you, uh, people who participate in the 401k, uh, they're, they've got their, that retirement savings. And after 10 years in the ESOP, uh, you will have other retirement savings in, in this employee stock ownership plan. And your plan is designed to recognize the fact that after 10 years, if you, are, uh, you have accumulated some wealth in there. And as you near retirement, you may feel more comfortable with that in a more diversified investment. And so the, pl the rule is if you have 10 years in the plan and you are at least 55 years old, you can take some of that, 25% of it, and move it into other investments. And that's really designed for uh, retirement planning purposes because it is all your eggs in that basket. And even if it's a great basket, you might feel more comfortable with them uh, spread out into other investments. Uh, and, and then when you hit uh, 60, if you're moving along that from 55 to 60, five years after you be first become eligible, you can diversify up to 50% while you still work at the company. So for the retirement planners out there, you know, people who are thinking that far out, it's not as if you're locked in as you near retirement when a significant portion of your retirement is in the, uh, in the ESOP. You can move some of it to other investments. So you're actually taking it out, though. You're taking yeah, it. Yeah, you're actually taking it out. Yeah, and yeah, moving it in. Uh, yep. 
Well, While you work at the company. Oh, oh, hold on. I, uh, you, you said distribution. It's not exactly a distribution. Yes, it is. It's, it's still held inside of... It's called diversification. And so you're, you are moving it into other investments, which generally is, if you have a 401k, that's the option you get. Okay, well, it's uh, a little bit after 12, which is when we said we would, would end. I'm, I'm, we can entertain one or two more questions if you'd like. Anyone? Okay, then um, I think what we'll do here is um, uh, sign off, and uh, we'll take this, this uh, presentation and uh, wrap it up. We're going to do two more of these uh, t uh, this afternoon here in, here in, uh, in Cleveland. And then um, one of them, I think we're going to try to record more than one of them, and we're going to make them available to the entire uh, uh, company uh, for those who, uh, who were unable to make it. So thank you, uh, Jay and Kathy and David, and thank you to all the great questions online on, uh, here. And we'll see you guys uh, another time. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.